Welcome to a community built of tomorrow's business leaders. Hey guys, I'm William Freitas and this is the Socius Podcast. Socius, welcome. Today we've got Ryan Dorohy on the show from Invigor Health. Uh, Ryan, mate, great to have you on the show. We've worked together uh, for a number of years really and it's been fantastic working with you. But mate, nobody does the introduction better than you do. So I'll let you introduce yourself. We always start with, you know, tell us who you are, what you do and, and really what's led you to be where you are today. I'd just like to say, first of all, I'm used to uh, insur- uh, my, uh, myself introducing myself to insurance companies, not insurance companies introducing themselves <laughs> to me as a physio. So that was... Uh, no fan- insurance companies here, mate. <laughs> <laughs> fair, that's, fair, a, that's a side thing. Fair, police, fantastic. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Ryan Dorohy. I uh, am a physiotherapist, uh, an ex-personal trainer, uh, a massive sport enthusiast, and uh, I love all things sort of holistic health as well, which I'll talk about in a second. But um, I've always been immersed in, in, in all things sort of fitness and health since a young age. Uh, I grew up in a, a very hyperactive family, uh, a family of, of four kids uh, who, who all have ADD um, and wow. all uh, with a dad who was a, a sports coaching teacher. So I played pretty much every sport under the sun you can think of. Um, from there, kind of uh, did a little bit of a, a, a traveling sabbatical where I went away um, for a number of years. I uh, used to work up on the Great Barrier Reef doing scuba diving instructing um, and then sort of started a fitness business while I was at university studying for physiotherapy, which was called Live Alive Fitness. It was basically an outdoor boot camp um, down, down on the beach where, uh, in Wollongong, where I'm from, uh, where we used to meet up sort of for a number of years. So I did that. And then, yeah, since then... Started uh, with physiotherapy. I've worked as a sports physiotherapist in elite sport teams like St. George Illawarra Dragons, Illawarra Hawks, New South Wales Blues Rugby League, uh, and then uh, decided to specialise more in the general population. So I, I, what I found was through physiotherapy, I I actually could see all these things that elite athletes were doing to make sure that their bodies were in prime condition and, and decided that this could definitely be done for the general pop too. In fact, it should be done because mm. if anything, an, an elite athlete's body is is well equipped to take on these high intense programs, yeah. whereas more and more we're starting as a, as a population to do these types of workouts, but we're not doing all the priming and the pre-stuff beforehand. So we're yeah. getting injured. And that's kind of why I started in Vigor Health. It was... It's a physiotherapy practice where we're trying not only to fix people's pain, but actually future-proof their issues as well. So they don't end up a person that's coming back to see us for the same injury time and time again for years to come. Perfect. And take us back into, uh, you know, obviously when you were in Wollongong running those boot camps, you were a physiotherapist at that time, not a physiotherapist, you were studying physio at that time, but you were a personal trainer at that time. Yeah. Yeah? What, What made you make that shift from personal training to physiotherapy? So when I was, so I was a, a personal trainer. I went over, <laughs> I went over to England. So my, my okay. ex partner was yeah. was English, and I went over to England as a scuba diving instructor. So yeah. you can imagine, I went from Cairns, uh, where you can get jobs as a diving instructor really, really easy, to yeah. to London, I mean, where, <laughs> where, where the the only job for me was in the London Aquarium, <laughs> and I did try that, and it didn't work. So I thought, what else can I do? What am I passionate about? And I got uh, the the PT certification. Worked in in London for a number of years. Um, it was a very fast track PT course. And uh, if I talk to PTs now, uh, personal trainers, I always advocate to do the longer course because you learn a hell of a lot more. Because when I come out out of the six or seven week course, I didn't know anything. And I remember people coming in to see me mm-hmm. with all these complex medical issues. And I didn't know a clue of what they're talking about. And Google became my best friend. And I was looking up different issues. And at the same time, I I didn't feel uh, safe treating these people. And I wanted to yeah. learn more. And that's what sort of sprung on the, the physiotherapy and, and studying physiotherapy. And that's why I, I came home from London, essentially. Yeah, right. It's so interesting. Um, on the last episode that we had, one of the last episodes that we had a, a few weeks back, um, we had Sean Dykoff and he was talking about, so he runs a gym himself and he was talking about how 
personal training is, is more like coaching these days and it's about you know the definition of coach is getting someone from point a to point b and i really hear here it's like when someone is you know dealing with some injury or or, or functionally moving functionally and, and having some challenges if you aren't doing the necessary study that you need to to perfect your craft then really you can't be showing someone how to train and and it's funny i i see it as as a, a bit of an issue in the industry at the moment where you potentially can be a personal trainer quite quickly because um, there's so such a variance in the quality of personal training um so that's exactly why you went into physio and, and developed that a hundred a hundred percent and i think off the back of of uh what your your last guest was talking about being a, a pt for for eight years um I can com- I'm completely aware that there are there are a, a massive variance between trainers, mm. and I remember starting and not having that ability to coach, but definitely um, there is the art to personal training, and and for for so many trainers to get to see how people tick and to be able to motivate somebody who's uh, either scared or completely disinterested in exercise and improving their health yeah. and to be able to motivate them to, to get better. That's an art. And that's something that I learned along the way with PT. That's really, really helped with me with physio. It's definitely a transferable skill. Yeah. Um, whereas with PT, we're trying to motivate people to, to live fit, fitter, more active lives and improve yeah. whatever their goal is with physio. We're trying to motivate, motivate people to do the stuff away from physiotherapy that actually can help them recover from an injury. And that's a very, that was something I learned in personal training uh, yeah. early on that I think really works well. With and physio. that'll obviously help people into the future. But before we keep diving into that, uh, take us on the journey as to obviously your personal training, you took on physiotherapy, you've now started in Vigor Health. How did you come about you know, creating your own, you know, place and, and what, what was the journey like there? To get to Invigo Health. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I, I finished the course with physio. I, I loved being a business owner. I really, really loved it. I, I, while I was doing. What is it about business owning that you love? I love the, I love the freedom. I love the freedom. I, I definitely uh, am. I've, I've talked to a, a psychologist on the podcast, uh, the, the podcast that I run as well called Fit After 35 Project. And yep. she was talking about different types of intelligence and me being an, an ADD kid, high school was never, uh, was, was, wasn't a good place for me because high school basically, uh, it pigeonholes people into, um, who can who can tolerate this is who can tolerate boredom the best or who can who can actually they're going to give you a task who can filter out all the outside noise and who can actually focus on this task and the people that can do it the best they get the best grades but it really pigeonholes intelligence into that category where for me I was never about that I, I'm I like creativity I like being able to to create things to create new projects to create new types of of physiotherapy sessions and for me i was pigeonholed into that and i found as a, a as a as a business owner like the sky's the limit you can you can use your creativity to to create new programs to to make mm-hmm. existing programs even even better uh, by listening to your clients and stuff and that's what i really enjoyed about about the the business that i had which was live a life fitness was that it it basically, uh, it basically was just meant to be a little side hustle that I did every yeah. so often. And it, I created this thing w- when I went back to being an employee as a physio when I first started. I, I missed it massively. And I, I always sort of craved to be the business, the business owner again. Yeah. Mm. I want to take it back to you mentioning you being an ADD kid mm. in school and, and wanting to thrive on creativity. But school was like a test of, of boredom, yeah. really. Um, you know, it's really funny. I, I was reading something the other day that yeah, school really doesn't teach people how to think. You know, divergent thinkers don't get born out of boredom at school. You know, school really needs to teach us how to think so that we can be divergent thinkers and think about how we're going to do things differently to improve this world. And I think that is what I hear in you, um, whether it's ADD or, or, or anything else. Um, you're a divergent thinker. Mm-hmm. You like to look at things differently um, and, and test the boundaries, really. And I, I suspect that's what you like about business or, or being out in, in the world where you are now. 100%. I, I think as well... With ADD, and I've met a whole heap of people that have ADD. They, if not handled the right way, you can you can grow up thinking you're stupid if you don't actually put yourself if, into environments where you can thrive. So if you if you're somebody 
because it's all it's all internal, right? You don't look at someone and go, "Oh, you're ADD." <laughs> you, 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 it's it's an internal thing what that you have. Known, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. So so basically, like for for ADD people, you might you might be you might be fo- you might be focusing on something or fourteen different things elsewhere besides school, but the teacher just looks at you and goes, "You're not paying attention." Hey, Ryan, concentrate. <laughs> you know, and that's 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 your high school. But if you if you get someone who's ADD on a task that they're passionate about. They can hyper focus. Eight hours can go by. You're working on something that you're passionate about, and and you'll be able to still concentrate and do things. and And that's kind of uh, that was that was something that I've learned that's helped me sort of grow into into yeah. a business owner as well. I find that super interesting. Like I've never heard it put that way, mm. where you know you can get so distracted at school, um, but whether you're ADD or whatever it might be. If you're passionate about something, you can hyper focus on something. That's that's phenomenal. It's true. That. It's just, it's 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 a uh, ADD is just a uh, an Ill, <laughs> an inability to tolerate boredom. So we we don't we don't tolerate we don't tolerate being bored. Like yeah. like if if we do, we start trailing off with our mind yeah. and stuff like that. So how did you find out that I guess sports or personal training or physiotherapy was your passion you, you mentioned that obviously you come with a family of three other siblings yeah um and all of you are add and your dad was hyperactive as well and obviously you were involved in a lot of sports but but how did you know that you weren't just a good sportsman and you you had to do this forever yeah i was, I was just I'm, I'm passionate about it so when i worked up on uh so i used to work on a liverboard boat right in in early beach in the wit sundays and i just found that when i was we'd we'd go out in the, the back deck and um i'd get i'd get bored and i'd want to i'd want to train because i grew up training i played rugby league and a lot of other sports and and so we, i'd take out we we had all the scuba diving tents and we'd go out onto the back deck and we'd start training with these scuba diving tents, doing shoulder presses, bent over rows, whatever, you know. And I started off just doing it on my own. And then uh, a lot of the other crew would come out and we'd do it. And then we started doing these like organized sessions just after we'd fed all the uh, all the passengers dinner. Oh, right. uh, and we started doing that. And then when I moved up to Cairns, I was doing um, going to the gym every day. And a, a lot of the other crew were coming over to me and asking me, uh, like, uh, what, what, what should I do about this particular exercise? Like, how can I, how can I get my back stronger or how can I, you know, get my legs stronger in this particular way? And, and then I found I was indirectly like coaching, even though I was on a PT then, um, yeah. that just sort of gravitated towards me wanting to, to pursue that. And physiotherapy, um, was, yeah, just purely wanting to learn more, wanting to learn more about the body. When I was, when I was young, I dis, uh, did a sprain of my AC joint in my shoulder and I went to, I went to the, the doctor, into the hospital, because I couldn't lift my arm above sort of 90 degrees. And mm. the doctor's like, like, go away, you're fine. It's just bruised. Mm. It's just a bruised shoulder. You'll be all right. Um, and it'll be moving perfectly in three or four days. And in three or four days, I wasn't moving it any further. And yeah. I went to the physio. And uh, I remember seeing the physio and the physio going, no, nah, it's not bruised. You've, you've, you've done a grade two AC joint issue, which is basically where your, your collarbone, where it connects with your shoulder, get stretched and the ligaments get all stretched. It's really painful. We get it quite a lot in the clinic. Um, and I always thought that was fascinating because you have this, I don't know, God complex on, on a doctor growing up that you would, that you would, you wouldn't think they would miss anything. Doctors and, have their own God complex. <laughs> yeah. Being able to, being able to see that physio was like super like, I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I, that was when I wanted to be one. It just took a number of years until I actually went and, and did the course. Yeah. Yeah. So really it was just bumping into someone who inspired you to be like, actually, wow. They've given me the advice that made the difference. I presume now you can get your shoulder well above 90 and it's changed your life so you want to do the same for others. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. And what do you think your key to success is? You know, what what has been the number one determinant factor for you to be able to, you know, succeed through life? Because I can imagine sometimes people get into personal training and go, you know what, it's it's too much of a hassle to go and study physiotherapy. Why would I bother? Why would I go back to uni or whatever it might be? You know, what's the underlying factor of success there? The underlying factor of success is just just trying things. I, I think having like with with the physiotherapy, uh, it was just actually trying new experiences and realizing that that was something that I could achieve. I think at the when I was younger, I didn't. Th- I thought physiotherapy may be a little bit above me, and that actually getting to go out and experience lots of different things has kind of taught me that. 
it was something that I could do. In terms of a key to success um, with business as well, I think just having a go of things has always worked really, really well for me. Like uh, I remember being a scuba diving instructor and uh, mum and dad going, well, why you won't get a job? Like, why would you go do this? I went and did the course and then got a job and just had, you know, five years worth of amazing experiences that I wouldn't change for the world. Or, you know, starting um, Invigor Health, uh, which was in the middle of the pandemic when I started it, which was just really, really unlucky timing. Mm. Um, I didn't know where it would would take me, but just actually having a go. And you do hear a lot of business people, famous business people say, the amount of times that I've failed and, and, and got myself back in and everything like that. And I haven't had any massive failures yet, but I definitely think there's a series of small failures that every business owner goes through. Um, and you can take that negatively or you can take that as if, okay, I've failed there. Let's try it a different way. Let's mm-hmm. try and do, uh, let's try and use a different angle. Let's put this, let's put this money into something else that may help like a, a little bit more. And then from there, you sort of guide your way into a specific formula that works for you and your particular type of business. And I think that's been something that's worked really, really well for me, trying trying new things and seeing how it goes. I love that, just giving it a crack, really. Yeah. I mean, great business, like you said, you know, great business leaders have, have dealt with failure and just kept going. I think a good business person is one who doesn't make the little decisions so significant. You know, it doesn't have to be that big, you know. Mm. what? So what if you fail? You can keep going. And, you know, when I bring it back to, you know, you giving physiotherapy a crack, my, int- my, I'm interested to know. Did you get the results in HSC to no, go into physiotherapy? No. I wanted to make that point clearly because, you know, an ADD kid might be told at school that he can't do physiotherapy because he's not going to get 90 UAI or wh- whatever it's bloody called these days. Um, I don't even know what it is, but I remember when I went to school, it was pretty high to get into physiotherapy. So, you didn't start down that route, but you decided you could still go down that route and give it a crack. A hundred percent. The the I remember when I first started. So, so my my uh, well, I don't even know what it's called either these days. When I went through, it was yeah. called UAI, and then when I came back, it was called ATAR, and I think it's called something I think else it's now. It's called ATAR now. Something. Um, but mine was like fifty eight. So I I had to do a stat test to get into health science. But once you're in university, and that's why I ha- I'll have parents come up because because physiotherapy when I got in was like a ninety eight, um, and I had parents come up and go, Ryan, tell my tell my kid who's going through high school how important the hsc is i'm like do you <laughs> do you really want to hear my answer like like and i'll tell the parents if she still wants to, me to tell her i'll tell the kid like i i did i i got in a different way and once i was in the health sciences which i'm passionate about still am i, I could learn like i could learn really really well i got a i got a, a cross between a distinction and a high distinction to get into physiotherapy and then once i was in physiotherapy Uh, I was fine and it's because I'm interested in it and Mm. everybody learns different ways. And for me, um, yeah, you, I think you got to find something you're passionate about and it's not, if you do have ADD, it's not because you're not because you're stupid. It's because you, you haven't found something that you're passionate about. How passionate about uh, uh, maths and and English can, can can you be? History. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's something that you need to, uh, you need to find your passion. And once you find your passion, You'll get that. You'll get that focus. Yeah. And what I can certainly hear in what you're saying right now is you wouldn't trade those experiences for the world. You know, you wouldn't trade that 58 for getting a 98 because you got to you know spend five years scuba diving in in Cairns and and that you would have learned so much more and just in that experience you found yourself coaching people on on a boat and um, you know you naturally found your feet. You naturally found your own leadership and. I think that's a, a huge part of it, really. Yeah, for sure. The I just yeah, I think I think the way I did it was perfect for me. Like I I I don't think I would have been ready for phys. Well, I wouldn't have got into physiotherapy firstly, but I mm. I I don't think I would have been ready for physio uh, when I was you know nineteen, and yeah. when I went back when I was twenty four, that was that was the right time. It was when I was ready to to study it and give you know. Uh, five years of my life to, to studying to studying to become a physio yeah yeah and, and what's an issue that you think is is you know really prevalent right now in business whether it's in your own industry or in business in general what's a key issue that you think needs changing a key yeah a key issue I think I'm going to speak about my own industry here because okay. I, I know it well is is that we we get into the habit particularly in busy places like the city of of 
getting people to come in, and I'm talking about um, allied health professionals in my sphere, so osteopaths, physiotherapists, chiropractors, we get into a we get into a strategy of getting people into for what's called these maintenance treatments. So say if you if you come in for for, for physiotherapy with me and we we kind of get your pain and your symptoms down, they're like, oh, all right, I'll see you uh, next month for a maintenance treatment. And they use this word maintenance treatment. And next minute you're on a maintenance treatment with a physiotherapist, a chiropractor or an osteopath that goes for the rest of your life. And that, that particular thing, by the end of the next month, you're like, holy crap, my neck's still really, really hurting. Well, you're not actually fixing the problem. You're, all you're doing is, is masking it. It's like putting a, a Band-Aid on a cut that's infected. You're, you're not actually fixing the problem. All you're doing is masking it. The, the, the infection is still under there. And so is the problem that someone's coming in to see me for. So if I'm not, if I'm not fixing that particular problem or giving them a strategy to actually help to fix that problem, then I'm, I'm just a pain therapist. I'm not a physical therapist. Yeah. And so, yeah, my philosophy, and if you have a look through... Uh, like Invigor Health's website and everything, the whole philosophy that we have is to to not just fix the pain, but to actually future-proof the problem so that the next time someone's coming to see me, it's not for the same headache, it's not for the same shoulder impingement, it's for a different thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's such a great, um, <laughs> it's such a great area mm. because, you know, if I come into your practice or anyone else's practice, I've got no bloody idea mm. how long this is going to take me. If I've got a knee injury, an ankle injury, a shoulder injury, whatever it might be, I'm really relying on on that professional. Um, and it seems almost predatory, you know, when we hear of, of that particularly in the sense that, you know, it might take you 10, you know, you get in, you get sold a package for a maintenance program of 10, 20, 30 sessions um, and you're forever maintaining this thing and not improving it. So I, I absolutely love the the model that you adapt, uh, you know adhere to but the interesting thing from a general business sense is it kind of makes sense to keep people coming through the door doesn't yeah, it yeah it's hard it's it becomes like a it becomes like a subscription model business mm-hmm. and i do think uh and i've talked to other health professionals that have the same philosophy as me it's a much it's a much slower start to your business mm. but i think in the long run it builds a lot more trust and respect with the health professional than the person that's coming in for maintenance treatments left right and center Um, you'll build your business quick but i think in time the person will start to to start to realize that these maintenance treatments well one are quite uh uh, quite costly to the to the pocket uh and two that their pain's still there by the end of the month yeah Uh, and it's i think yeah while you get a, a, a slower start in that particular type of business model i think in time, uh, it'll hel- it helps to grow uh, your health business even more with that trust yeah. and respect. I think it's an integrity thing too, you know, like uh, particularly if someone comes into your practice and, and they don't get what they need straight away or, or, or within the timeline that they think they should be and that they're continually going. If they find the next person that, that definitely helps them, um, it's an integrity thing. They're going to love that person. And the other thing is to... Doing a maintenance program, I find at some point those clients or those patients become detractors, really. They don't become raving referrers. And I think that's the one thing that I like about your model of business and how the practitioners in your space do it the way you do it is they might not come in you know, three weeks later because f- you've fixed their issue, but they will say, hey, I know a great physiotherapist or, or practitioner that you should go and speak to because they'll fix you in two or three weeks yeah. as opposed to string you on for nine. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's a huge thing. It's like, uh, yeah, it's like, like when you, when we psychologists, they always talk about teaching people self-efficacy or the ability to handle their problems by themselves. And I think physiotherapy is in that same token. We do for sure. We do all the manual skills that other physios and chiros do the, the joint mobilization, the massage, the, the cupping, dry needling, all that sort of stuff. Mm. But it's as a tool to get people to a point where they don't need that stuff anymore. And where they can actually do exercises that improve their ability to handle their own problem. And life's full of physical problems. Like you can you can have a look at my history; it's, it's littered with injuries. <laughs> but but like I've overcome them, and I'm okay now. And and that's the thing. Like your your problems your problems can be fixed. Yeah. You'll cut you for sure. You'll you'll. I won't be the last time I see you, but it'll be for a new thing. Yeah. yeah. And how many people tell you that it's a it's a bad idea? It's a shit business model. I've had a few, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah for sure. Because I wonder what percentage of practitioners at the moment do it the way you do it. Yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm not 
pigeonholing everyone into no. that. I think for sure there's a whole heap of practitioners doing it my yeah. way, but there is a lot of practitioners doing the other way. Now, now whether they, they realize, because cause for some practitioners, they 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 believe that they're they're helping the people and right. and and for some people they want to see those practitioners they enjoy it they enjoy you know coming right. in to get the the monthly meet up and and that's fine but I think uh, for me ethically I, I I think of it as a I think of I think of allied health in general I think of mm. us as problem solvers and I think if we're if we're solving the problem the pain won't come back we've we've helped to fix that person and and future proof their problem yeah. rather than rather than um yeah you know just just being another um alternative remedy instead of using drugs yeah i, I love that um talking about drugs though what's your issue on oh, i guess what's your view on um you know the health space and and the use of drugs to get over things you know whether it's diabetes or your know, heart conditions whatever it might be tell us a little bit more about that yeah, yeah. So I think um, I think we're a real we're we're still very much, and we're we're slowly moving, but we're still very much a reactive, curative society. Mm. Uh, born on a lot of the funding that comes from the top down from the government is is in relation to to curative models. Um, you get type two diabetes, which is a lifestyle related diabetes. And there's rebates on getting metformin, which is essentially a, um, a type 2 diabetes medication. Or you get heart disease. Um, you've got all these different medita- um, medications to help regulate your, your heart and your, or maybe your heart arrhythmias or your, or your heart problems to help with blood pressure. Yeah. But these are things that are, that are present when we've already got the underlying issue. For type 2 diabetes uh, and for, for heart disease, they're both things that can be uh, lifestyle-related things that can be modified years, 10 years, 20 years before mm. in order to improve um, somebody's physical health and well-being. And, and, and it's something where they're at the moment there's no funding. I talked to an integrative GP about it actually and he one of the things that deters people from seeing him is that he, because he is a specialist doctor, his um, his consults are quite expensive. They're a ninety minute consult. They cost about five hundred bucks, uh, and you need to go get all these tests. Some of them are covered by Medicare, but the majority of them aren't because they're preventative type tests that you right. can get done. And so, people people don't get to access these types of people unless you're more, come from like a, like you're more affluent. And and mm. that and that seems to be the problem. We're not putting funding into preventative causes. We're putting them into these reactive, curative uh, uh, models of, of, of giving people drugs for all the ailments. And do you think there's any sort of room for... Well, there's obviously room for movement, but what's it going to take to change that? Because it doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's it's an issue that's at the forefront of people's minds um, because, you know, I don't think things change. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It's, I think it has to come from people's, people, uh, people being more aware and people starting to access these things by themselves uh, mm. because, yeah, we could go down the whole rabbit hole of, yeah. of pharmaceutical companies and stuff like that. But, but definitely there is a lot of, uh, there's, a lot of there's a lot of power there um, mm. for, for, for that particular type of model uh, right. and there are a lot of lobbyists and things like that but um, I think people individually need to start accessing these things we're in an age where there's never been more information in relation to health yeah. um, there's so many podcasts there's so many uh, uh, TV shows even look look at yeah. Netflix there's a whole heap of stuff coming up yeah. now some of it some of it's a little <laughs> bit sensationalized but but there is elements of truth in all of that as well and and you can access a lot of this information you just kind of Need to know, need to know where to look. So, trying to access preventative health, uh, or like alternative things that you can actually start to have a look at, will will help boost your health. And health's not just about physical. Like you can have the six pack, you can have the you can have the massive arms, and and still be really really uh, unhealthy uh, holistically as well. So, health is a is a, is a whole spectrum of things. It's not just yeah. the physical, which I deal with mental. You've got all the different uh, nutritional deficiencies that can happen with people mm. as well, and um, yeah, it's good to it's good to to try and access different types of things for more information. You touched on a good point there, though. How does one disseminate the amount of information that's out there? Because you know, there's a whole lot of false information as well, a lot of bias information. So, I think that's a real challenge, uh, particularly in the health space. Is do you become vegan? 
or do you or are you a vegetarian or are you to become a carnivore um from a diet perspective things are so um you know polar opposite at times depending on the information you're taking in i think from a movement perspective as well physically there are different methodologies as well that you know people read and they're like oh actually 20 years ago it was fine for me to squat this way but now i can't squat this way you know it's, it's quite hard to get through that i mean how would what would you propose what would you suggest for people out there what should they look at are there are there credible sources for you to review or the the thing not? that I, the thing that i would say is that all these sciences, particularly the physical and nutritional sciences, they're very they're very new. Like we haven't been doing it. Like we've been studying for a number of years, but as a direct science, it's not a really, really, a really, really old science. So when when we do look at at evidence, the evidence is constantly changing. Mm-hmm. Um, so who knows where it'll be in ten years? But the the thing is with uh, with the way that that health professionals are taught in university nowadays, we're not taught to to memorize the textbook, we're actually taught how to how to look up credible research and how to appraise that research to make sure that it's of the highest quality. Um, so if if you can access health professionals, that's the way to do it as a starter because they can help uh, help you decipher through the the crazy web that we that we live in, where there's so many so many different things and and so many people um, telling you lots of different things. It's it's basically um, yeah, seeing seeing a health professional is something I'd suggest, mm. and and I myself would always do it as well. If 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 I'm looking at something that I know nothing about, it's always better to to talk to a, a professional first, um, and then they can lead you in the direction of where the research is in in relation, whether it's mental health, whether it's physical health, like what I do, or whether yep. it's um, nutritional as well. You can actually be helped in in all those categories. Yeah, interesting. I mean, the thought that goes through my mind is, you know, particularly from a mental health perspective or physical health, but even physical health. I remember going through, you know, primary school, there was a compulsory sports element to it. Mm. High school was less so, but there was still a part of a sport element. You get to university, there's nothing. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting, you know, your first point around, you know, being uh, reactive from a medicine sense. Mm. Um you know, really we should probably just come up with a program where people continually get involved physically in, in things. So that, that'll be a game changer. But who's who are we to sort of predict yeah, what it it's, looks like? Yeah, it's a hard one, isn't it? Like it, it really does need to come from it really does need to come from the top down. We do have mm. government funding and that gets allocated to different things. But mm. I, I do think um for people who who can really help with preventative health, um, like uh, for allied health professionals, for even uh, specific doctors, like I was telling you about, integrative uh, general practitioners, yeah. even uh, psychologists that as well. There's a lot of psychologists out there that are, are preaching proactive uh, mental health consults, not just reactive when you've put yourself into such a hole or you're yeah. depressed Absolutely. that then you access uh, a psychologist yeah. that we can reduce that stigma attached to mental health as well and actually um, access, you know, our psychologist to help with our mental health and be proactive about it as well. Absolutely. I'm a big advocate for that as well. Mm. Uh, What's your views on the vision of not only your industry, but your business moving forward? Where are you taking it? Where do you see things moving? So I'm really passionate about helping people after the age of 35 i started yeah. my podcast which is called the fit after 35 project so i pretty i basically I, what i found was like i was telling you about before that I, I knew a hell of a lot of my own industry uh but didn't know a lot on what different health professionals did and their views and philosophies on on health as well because everybody has such such a different view depending on what what industry you're in um so I I started the the podcast just to gain more knowledge and, and since i've been talking to a lot of people um I I think the where I'd love to go is is creating creating a product where people can access preventative preventative health and proactive health um, holistically across different spectrums. So having having a a, a product that actually a person can come in, be assessed, and actually get the help where it's needed. If it's if their mental health is is isn't great, that they can go and see a psychologist. If their physical health, they can come see myself. Nutrition, they can go see you know a dietitian, a naturopath, somebody that can can help get their whole holistic health into into a better sphere. And that that's basically where I'd really like to take um, both my own business in Vigor Health and 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 start uh, creating this this 
holistic health package for people over the age of, of 35. It's like a sort of one-stop shop for people yeah. over 35. Yeah. To, now, the interesting point is, does it start at 35 or does it start before that where, you know, once you get to 35, you can still rewind some of the, those damages or do you need to start between 30 to 35 functionally to ensure that when you are 35 upwards, you're, you're in good snick? 100%. I think um, I picked 35. So the reason I picked 35 was it was a very, very common age of, of retirement for, for people in most sports. And I was about to say, mate, I'm not retiring at 35. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, it'd be good with it for a yeah. business. Yeah, yeah, just live the good life. No, if, uh, if for retirement from people from sport when they're about 35. But there's a hell of a lot of people pushing the boundaries. And that's why I wanted to, to do the podcast. Like you've got, you know, um, Roger Federer, 40, still playing tennis. Um, Tom Brady, I think he is 44 now. Um, Too old. Yeah, still still playing. still, But they're doing all these 1% things right. So that's how they've been able to sustain their bodies. And I think... Um, I think it all starts before 35, to be honest. I think yeah. um, it, it all starts, it can start sort of even in your teens if you have some sort of inherent issue that, that's wrong with you and, and uh, you've, you maybe have had a, a, an injury early on, that you can start to do things to, to help with that knee because you don't want to be uh, the old fella who's having a premature knee replacement at, at 45 when, when you could be having it. Never, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And obviously, that's a, a key sort of vision for your business, which is which is awesome. I love the idea of a one-stop shop, um, proactive health mentality. Um, from an industry standpoint, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, what's what's the vision there for for, for physio, for physio oh, oh. and health in general? Oh. Is it just more of the same sort of that you know preemptive, um, proactive health? Is it hopefully do we get some funding in there, or what do you reckon? Yeah, I'd love it. Look, I think um, I think the the proactive is the way that we need we need to go. We need to we need to be able to uh, work on like public awareness of what a physio actually is, because mm. definitely you you could ask you know probably probably six or seven people out of ten would would see physiotherapy as somewhere you go um, to get a massage when you've had an injury. Yeah. Um, which it's so much more than that about rehabilitation, about um, restoring a person back to their optimal physical conditioning as well, and and yeah. that that doesn't just have to happen when you're injured. That can happen when you're when you're you you feel well, but you just want to get to know a bit more about mm -hmm. your body. You will find things wrong with your body that you can work on, yeah. and that's where I think we need to increase public awareness about about proactive. And that doesn't just happen in physio; that can happen yeah. across across health spectrums and different fields as well. Mate, what I'd like to do as uh, sort of like a parting gift as well, if you don't mind, is um, particularly right now, everyone's dealing with, you know, states around the country going in and out of lockdown. Um, routines are being thrown around, I'm putting you on the spot here. But if you've got a few tips for not only business owners, but for people that being at home, what are things that they can do to sort of keep, you know, physically in good shape, mentally in good shape, um, because it makes a huge difference, right? I know myself personally, having been in lockdown a number of times, um, it's challenging. It's yeah. really challenging. When you're out of that routine and you're not moving physically, um, it's quite easy to, easy to spiral down. Um, do you have some tips that you could share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've got a number of them, but I think um, I'll just keep it purely physio-related. Yep. I always talk about um, the big tips for improving posture pain because what happens is, uh, every lockdown, my uh, my rate of posture pain that come into the clinic increases significantly. Um, whether it's your neck, uh, whether it's a head headache that you think's coming because you're too dehydrated, but it's actually coming from your neck. Um, whether it's uh, th thoracic or upper back pain, lower back pain, hip pain, a lot of it comes from your seating arrangement. <clears throat> so. Get your seating arrangement right first. Make sure that you're not that person who's hunched over their laptop because you are going to get injured. Whether you feel it or not at the moment, you will get injured. Get mm. yourself a laptop razor. Prop your laptop up so it's at eye level. Make sure you've got one of those Bluetooth keyboards so that when you when you sit, you've got your, your elbows relaxed with your, with, your, with your traps or your neck muscles down as well. And get yourself a, an ergonomic chair as well if you can. If that's going to be, if you're, if you're an office worker, if that's what you do, and that's your principal place of where you're going to be operating. You need to make sure you've got a good chair. If you if you can't financially afford a chair, 
stick uh it's a bit of a hack but stick roll up a towel and stick it behind your lower back and what that does is it actually anteriorly tilts your pelvis so it tilts your pelvis forward which makes it really really hard for you to slump into that crappy posture where your shoulders mm -hmm. roll forward so that would be my first one warm up effectively because if you if you're anything like the most people that come into the clinic you're doing heaps of push-ups, you're doing heaps of squats, and you're doing some form of jumping as well in your living room, and you're you're getting injured. So, definitely warm up your warm up your your complete body, and a proper warm up um, takes a good fifteen to twenty minutes. And for, for the majority of us, we're not doing a fifteen to twenty minute warm up. Warm up yeah. So, um, yeah, if you if you need access to a particular warm up guide, I've designed an ebook um, which you can get at invigorhealth.com.au slash warm-up guide um, and you can download that and that's just got it's basically a tailored warm-up guide for office workers that I've, I've made um, which is a 15-minute warm-up that you can do prior to your sessions that can bring your injury rate down by about 50 percent so it's quite a it's quite a uh, awesome. quite a good one perfect mate that, that there are some great tips posture 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 and warm-up yeah. because mate I know definitely when I Go down to my uh, outdoor PT session. I uh, rock up on the spot <laughs> at the time that I'm supposed to start my yeah. session and I'm not warming up a whole lot. So, yeah. But I think that there are some great tips. I think it's been a great chat. I've loved getting to know more about you as a business owner and, and your background. I no idea you were ADD, mate. So it's completely <laughs> internal, as you mentioned. Yeah, so, that's right. Um, thank you for that. Um, obviously, the natural elements is plug your your socials if you can mate um obviously it's the fit after 35 project but you've got invigor health where pe where can people find you yeah i'm um, on like on all socials you can find me i'm definitely really active on on instagram i'm always posting good exercises for specific issues um so yeah hop on to invigor health on instagram the fit after 35 project um, I'm usually talking to people once a fortnight, so it'll be a. I, I don't just go for health professionals. I usually it's it's definitely health professionals, mm. um, but that includes you know uh, like health professionals, PTs, um, even everyday legends that are pushing the boundaries of what it is to stay active and perform at a high level uh, uh, after the after the age of 35. So, um, feed up to 35 project on Instagram. You can get that wherever you get your your uh, your podcast from. Um, and then, yeah, if you, even if you want to reach out, you can reach out actually through through my website, invigorhealth.com.au and, um, yeah, access that warm-up guide if you if you want to keep those injuries down in lockdown as well. Perfect. Mate, Ryan, appreciate coming on the show, mate. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Socius, thank you for joining us today. Please hit the subscribe button if you've enjoyed this episode. And if you'd like to be part of the Socius community, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn to stay in touch. Cheers.